it again this time. How you doing this morning? Boy, you guys are so excited. Wow. I know. I hope you have enough. I, uh, well, I figure it this way. We don't have to stockpile for this week, for, for tomorrow and Tuesday, because we've already stockpiled. <coughs> so everything, you know, that's one thing good about living in Pittsburgh. Um, uh, somebody texted message me last night, and I thought it was kind of funny. And the person said, um, you actually think it's going to snow by tomorrow morning to cancel church because my text message to everybody was, if we don't have church, then we'll have the live stream on when I'm supposed to be there. And I said, how long have you lived in Pittsburgh? <laughs> don't you realize that you get lake effect snow? And they if, I don't know if you've noticed yet, but they ha it's almost impossible to predict the weather in Pittsburgh. Worse than all the other cities I lived in. It's almost impossible. What they start out with at the beginning of the week and what they end with, and then what really happens are three different things. And um, so, uh, you know, I knew, that I didn't know if there was going to be snow, ice, and, and we were pretty close. Our, our, our parking, our, our um, driveways and walkways were all, were all iced over this morning. Um, I'm having a little technical difficulty this morning. I'm not sure if what I'm going to be using works, but I'm having a problem with the file <laughs> that I have on my, my um, iPad here. And um, hopefully this is going to work this morning because I, I have to be able to see some of my notes this morning. But anyways, I'm glad you're here this morning. I'm glad those that stayed home stayed home because it is icy in some spots and our walkways and our driveways can be icy. Um, and, and this is like a normal attendant. This is a normal COVID attendant. Uh, we hopefully, as COVID, as this begins to wind down and we see it winding down, that we will get more and more people back. Psalms 29 says, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in, in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, the mountain like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with lightning, flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, we all cry, glory. There's one day of the year when love is celebrated in abundance. Big red hearts passed to all of our friends, bags of the best chocolate consumed by the pound, cards, candy, nice meals, surprise gifts. It's lavish and lovely and reminds us of all the good things. But what does love look like when it spills to every other day of the year? Maybe it's food banks always stocked, hard conversations over hot cups of coffee, holding the hand of a stranger, sticking it out through hard times, sitting in grief that's not even yours, delivering hope through a simple card, laughter and goodwill, provision, protection, patience, forgiveness before it's asked, walking a mile in another's shoes. We know this kind of love because we saw it. Love is the son willing to hang on the cross the God willing to die in our place. The Father who had a plan to save his children from the moment he created us. We were always on his heart and still are every day of the year. Lord, we are here this morning to worship you. We are here to listen to you. 
to listen to your love, to listen to your mighty voice, to listen to your gracious love.
Victoria is um, is up with her her, her bew. <laughs> um, Curtis lost his her lost his grandfather um, a day or so ago, Friday, Friday night, uh, and it was pretty sudden. Curtis said so. Keep him in prayer uh, during this time. But she's up there visiting with him, comforting, and uh, just working with the family. Um, pull out your sermon notes. It's, you, uh, it's the little pink sheets of paper. You should be taking notes. The reason why is I'm giving you a lot of good stuff, and you need this, okay? And this is good stuff. I mean, I paid, I paid thousands of dollars to get this stuff, and uh, I'm giving it to you. So really, uh, this is today, I, I'm going to just caution you, today is going to be a little difficult to get our minds around. Because I'm going to begin to break down some of the concepts of that we were raised with and some of the ideas of what we think of God are going to be challenged today. And that's okay. It's always good to challenge some things. Uh, it doesn't make God any different, but there's just a new way of thinking about things. So you have to listen to the whole message and so that we can kind of get an idea of what is going on and what God wants us to learn this morning. Last week, we learned that we cannot be afraid of God and love God at the same time. We cannot be afraid of God and love God at the same time. It's either one or the other. It's either a love relationship or it is rules uh, rules oriented, and that's not even a relationship because it's a, it's a rules oriented lifestyle where you follow a set of rules so that God will confirm you as being holy and faithful, but you're never sure. Or you're in a love relationship with God, and you experience His love. The reason why we say this is because in Romans one seventeen it says. The righteous shall live. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's not what I wanted to say. We learn this because it says in 1 John that where there is love, there is no fear. So the whole center of the Bible is for God to show his love to his creation. To tell his creation how much he loves them and to show it to him. So last week we learned that the righteous will live by faith. This is the center theme of the Bible. The whole Bible surrounds about this, that we who are lost will learn to live by faith and accept the love of God. This concept of faith, you can actually put in the word love, that the just shall live by love. Faith and love are synonymous. We're going to learn that next week or the week after. Not sure which one yet. But, um, oh no, it's going to be the week after. That's right. Uh, the 28th, we're going to learn that faith and love is the same thing. You can't have faith and not love. And you can't love without faith. For example, I cheat on my wife and say I love you. Is that true love? Because there's no trust there. There's no faith there. You can't do something to someone to lose their trust, to lose their faith, and then turn around and say, but I still love you. So faith and, tr and love are really the same thing. God decided to bring us back into this relationship of love. And, and the key way that he's going to bring us back into the relationship of love is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish or shall not die, but have eternal life. And what I think is kind of funny is they went, back, they went from perish to die and back to perish. So I'm not sure if we're perishing or if we're dying. Okay, so... Um, What's so funny about this is when they came out with the NIV back in, the, in, in 1983, how many people were so appalled how they changed. 
John 3.16. Because, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's okay. But, but this, for God so loved the world that he gave his, because we took out the word begotten and put in his one and only son. Again, we'll talk about why that happened later on. That's going to be in March. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. See, reason why I'm doing this, why don't you just tell us now? Because these are little, hey, you need to come to church and hear these great sermons that you're going to hear about John 3.16. We're taking this sermon, this, uh, uh, the whole three months of sermon um, series to deal with this concept of John 3.16, that God so loved the world. We learn that God started out being Elohim. Elohim is the generic form of God. God created, Elohim created the earth. We then learned that we went from Elohim to Yahweh. This is God's personal name. This is his first name. He doesn't have a last name. This is Yahweh, his personal name. God went from a generic being to a personal God. And because we feared this, we're afraid of this personal God to do something that could hinder us from getting to heaven, okay, from being with him in eternity, we then decided that we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, or followers of God, decided that we couldn't use the name Yahweh. So many times in the Bible you'll see the word Adonai, that will describe the relationship, not in a personal way, but in a master slavery way. That God is the master who will keep me in line if I don't behave myself. But God is a personal God who takes interest in his creation. And we, we saw last week in these names of God, how we describe God, we learned that when we got into the New Testament with Jesus, Jesus took Yahweh, the personal God, and began to call him Daddy. And because of that, we need to move from Elohim, a generic God who is out there, and I fear, to a Daddy. And we need to begin to view God as a Daddy. And this does not take away from God, this adds to who God is. Because we want to know who this daddy is, because even though we may have different terminology for him, describing who what he is, there are these things that describe, there are these things called attributes that describe God's workings, who he is. What is an attribute? An attribute is the essence of God, his being, his very nature, his character. But an attribute goes beyond the character of God. If, if <clears throat> These attributes of God are so important that if you take away one of these attributes we're going to talk about this morning, God no longer is God. So whether you call him Elohim or Daddy, he's going to have these four attributes that we're going to talk about this morning, and they're going to describe how he interacts, how he works, his very nature, his very essence, who he is, his character. <clears throat> because the attributes of God... Are the, are the absolute realities of God's existence. The attributes of God are the absolute realities of God's existence. You cannot argue whether God has these attributes or not. Once you argue that he does not have them, he is no longer Yahweh, Elohim, Adonai. He is just another God that no longer exists. So what are these attributes? These attributes are what we call omni-attributes, meaning complete, absolute, all-encompassing. So 
The first one is omnipresence. Okay? God's omnipresence. What does this mean? In each, each, each category, I'm going to give you some ideas as to what, what they mean. Um, omnipresence means that God is everywhere at the same time. God is everywhere at the same time. God has no limits to space and time. This, is, it, this, this whole understanding of omnipresence is very, very important to understand when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, a follower of God. If we wrap our minds around the fact that God does not operate in space and time, then we can make some sense of this world. Okay? So where do we kind of get read where God is omniscient? Or, I'm sorry, omnipresent? Psalms 139, 8 through 9. Well, Psalms 139, 8 through 9. Challenging Raymond's ability to to transfer back and forth. There you go. It says, If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Colossians 1.17 says, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Not only does omnipresent mean that God is everywhere, okay? Omnipresent means that God is active in all things. He is everywhere, and God is active in all things, all right? He is working within our government while working in the Russian government, as well as the Haitian culture, while helping the little child who lost his toy. See, we have to think what omnipresence is, that he is at work all across the world at the same time. He is active in all things. He is active when there is war. He is active when there is peace. He is active when there are riots. He is active when we come to church. He is active in all things. He is not active in things. So God is not in a pew, okay? He is not in a church building. See, we say, that's God's house. <laughs> you, cannot have an ab uh, uh, you cannot have an omnipresent God who is in his house. <laughs> and say that this is the house of God. It takes away from God's omnipresence. Where he is on the other side of the world, who is asleep right now, while he is actively working here in our church, while he's on the other side of the country who's just waking up, he is active in all things. He is not active in things. God can exist without humanity, but humanity cannot exist without God. So God has to be active in all things because if God is not active in the things of this world, then we would not exist. Because the only reason why we exist is because of God. He brings everything, being omnipresent means he brings everything together and he's working everything for his will, for his good. Okay. Third, God does not operate in time. If you can get anything out of this message this morning, get this. God does not operate in time. 
He does not operate in the past. He does not operate in the present. He does not operate in the future. He operates in the past, present, and future at the same time because he is in all things. He's omnipresent. He does not operate in time. God, live, uh, God lives in the past, present, and future at the same time. So what we need to do is take off our little God watches and smash them. Because a lot of our thinking about God operates in time and space. That he operates this is the reason why we cannot get our, that's the reason why some people think that the world was created in a 24-hour day when God did not create day and night until the fourth day, but he still operated in a 24-hour day time period, that he operated in seven actual 24-hour times to create the world. We believe that so much because we wear a God watch. And God wakes up when I wake up. And God goes to bed when I go to bed. And I pray the prayer. What is it? Now I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> my soul, my, what is it? <laughs> soul to keep. If I die, we teach our kids this <laughs> before I wake. Get the watch thing out of our head because this brings us to the second understanding of God, the second characteristic, the second attribute of God. God has to be omnipresent or he is not God. He is in all things or he is not God. Once we place God in time, we no longer make him God. When we say to God, I want this, boom, 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 now, we no longer make him God. When we bring God into seven 24-hour days of the creation of this world, he is no longer God. Because you are wanting God to operate in time, not omnipresent present. This brings us to the second attribute, which is omniscient. God is all-knowing. God is all-knowing. Psalms 147 says, He, God, determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limits. John 1, 1 John 3, 19 and 20 says this. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts because he and he knows everything. So God does not operate in space and time. God operates in time at the same time, and he knows all things. So we conclude, because God knows everything, he has predestined our lives, and we have no choice but to live out the path God has chosen for us. <laughs> Wrong answer. But God knows everything, so he knows my life. Get God out of time. Because the concept of omniscience within the concept of omnipresence means that God allows us to be who we are, and we can choose who we are. Because God operates solely in the here and now. Even though we say we don't believe in predestination, 
Our fate life is already determined by God because we say things like, well, if their time is up, there's nothing they can do about it. <laughs> Predestination. If their time is up. One of the ways that we see this is when we see that God took a person or God planned it this way. <clears throat> this is not what is meant that God is omniscient. God does not know what we are going. God, okay, listen, this is going to be tough. God does not know when we are going to die, when we are born, and what decisions we are going to make, or even what we are going to eat for breakfast tomorrow morning. He doesn't know these things. These aspects of life are not a concern for him because he operates in the past, present, and future at the same time. God is omni, omnipresent. God lives in the past, the future, and the present by encompassing them. I'm sorry, listen to this. God lives in the past and future by encompassing them into the present. God has this understanding of what is going on. He can foretell the future. He doesn't plan the future. So he can say, hey, Israel, you see that nation Babylon down there? If you don't behave myself, they're getting bigger, and you're goofing around with all these strange gods instead of the one and only God, so this is what's going to happen. I will withhold my protection, and they will overtake you. It's a foretelling. If Israel at any time turned and repented, God would not have done that because throughout the Old Testament, people have had the ability to change God's mind. Like who? Hezekiah? Jonah? He was so mad because... He was going to wipe out Nineveh, and then God didn't. And he went and pouted, because we can change the mind of God. Moses did it. And it's throughout the Bible. God does not have the concept of past, present, and future. But he knows, yes, he knows all things, but not in the concept of time. But he knows what's going to happen in the future. Once you say that, you take God out of his omnipresence and puts him into time. We need to take our God watches off and smash them. Because we are, not born, we are not born with a clock that starts ticking until we are done on this earth. God does not have these little uh, timers that he sets. Oh, there's, there's, as you all know, what was his name? I keep on wanting to call him Joshua. <laughs> Is his name Joshua? All right. <laughs> oh, I keep on wanting to call him Josiah, not Joshua. Joshua was born just, a, just about a day or so ago, okay, and we have little uh, Micah. I want to call him Michael, so hey, we have little Michael here. God did not start a Joshua Micah timer that is ticking until the day we return to eternity. When we have those concepts, then God is taken out of his omnipresence and omniscience and brought into time. God does not operate in the concept of time. 
God is not concerned about when we are born because it's a part of life for God. He knows who we are. He knows everything about us. He knows and he will then allow us to operate within the conditions that he created. There's another, there's another omni we're going to get to and it will make a little more sense when we get there. These things are going to happen because of the type of world we live in and the decisions that we make, not because God caused them. Birth is the result of, death is the result of, how we live our life and all the things we go through in our life are not the result of God putting us in those places, but it is the decisions that we make because we live in a world that is sinful. Okay? So you cannot say God caused COVID on America because America turned their backs on God and this is the wrath of God. That is so, wow, wrong. When we say God's wrath is upon those people, this is so, and unfortunately, you won't learn about God's wrath until next week. <laughs> but that is so wrong. When we say the wrath of God did this to that person or these people, we take away and minimize the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross. God knows and understands what is happening now and works with the decisions and events of life to bring about his understanding of what the future should bring. Let me read that again. Okay? God knows and understands what is happening now and works with the decisions and events of life to bring about his understanding of what the future should bring. God's presence operates in the now and understands the future through the decisions we make in the now. So you're driving a car at 125 miles an hour and you see a patch of ice? No, this played out, I mean, down in Texas. I saw a video. You know, they're coming down this highway. You know, they're going too fast. Big truck. <laughs> Why didn't God stop that? God operates in the now with the decisions that we make. The decision that was made was to drive fast on ice, and now God will deal with the consequences of those decisions and each person at the same time. That, George... That is, for those who are online, George says free will is something. And that, George, is so big and such a big concept to understand. Because, George, that will bring us to number three. But before we go on to number three, we have to understand when it comes to the omniscience of God that humanity is obsessed with the sun. <laughs> Okay, because we are obsessed with sun rises and goes down, sun rises and goes down. Because God operates and knows everything and he does not have the concept of time, then he can act justly and wisely with humanity. And we have to get away from the sun rises and sun goes down and the moon rises and the moon goes down and understand that God is dealing with the now. He works in the now. The past, the future is encompassed in the present. And that way, God can respond justly and fairly and wisely. Because he's working with the decisions we make now. 
not the decisions we're going to make in the future. Why doesn't God know about those? Because he's working in the now. He doesn't have a concept of time. He doesn't know the choices. We, he, he actually doesn't care about the choices we're going to make in the future because he wants to know what's happening now. He doesn't work in time. Once we say, but God knows we put him in time, and he does not operate in time. This brings us to number three. It's called omnipotence, not omnipotent, <laughs> as some of us might pronounce it. It's pronounced omnip omnipotence, okay? Was, was in a message one time, educated man was preaching, and he was talking about the omnipotence of God. And I'm like, oh! <laughs> Unfortunately, I was in college at the time, and it really, 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 it's the, uh, it's the omnipotence of God. The omnipotence of God means that God is all-powerful. God is the Superman of supermen. God is Marvel and DC superheroes pressed all into one. He has the power to overcome everything, and he has the power to overcome everything and anything. He is so powerful that God can do anything he wants. This brings us to the understanding of sovereignty. We talk about what it means, we talk about what it means to be sovereign. Sovereign means that God is so powerful, he rules over everything. There is nothing he cannot do. He has absolute authority over the world and humanity. He is omniscient, he is omnipresent, he's omnipotent, and he has authority over the world and humanity. What he says goes. What happens, happens. Uh, Daniel 4.35 says, His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the people of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? He is the only God. There is no other God. He is absolute power. It makes him the absolute ruler over the universe. Okay, let's go back. So we have here, God is all-powerful. God is sovereign. Okay, God has limitations. And that's what makes him all-powerful. He has limitations. God cannot sin. It is out of his character to sin. He is incapable of sinning. There is no way that God can sin. God is a holy being and is incapable of doing evil. God's wisdom is absolute, and he has the best for interest. Second, God cannot do anything that contradicts himself. So the question is, can God make a boulder so big that he himself can't lift it? No. No. Because God is incapable of contradicting himself. George, this is where it goes back to free will. God gave us free will. And he cannot contradict himself by taking away that free will or choosing our life for us predestining our life for us. Hang on, George. Because the power of God is that he cannot contradict 
who he is and the decisions that he's made and what he has done. This brings us to the final omni. It's God is omni-good. <laughs> All right, that doesn't exist. God is holy. God is holy. He does nothing that is evil. God in his all-powerful being cannot contradict his holiness. And what it means to be holy, 1 Peter 1, 6. But just as he is called, you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. This is a moral aspect. God's holiness means morality. The morality that God, because God is a moral being. And God being all-powerful, omniscient, omnipresent, doesn't have time, understands what morality is. And he is the one who defines morality. Because he is sovereign. This is what humanity should be living like. This is how they live in the concept of love. God is the one who set down the moral code. What was the moral code? The Ten Commandments. When it says that Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it, he came to fulfill the Ten Commandments and how we are supposed to live, not to abolish the Ten Commandments. God is a moral being who cannot do evil. God is good. Matthew 7, 11. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? God gives good gifts to us. When we experience God in the midst of suffering, that is a good gift. What is the suffering? The result of living in a world that is evil, that is sinful. God does not do evil. God cannot be evil. God will not do evil. God does not exist with evil. God does not anything. So that's why when someone says that the wrath of God is upon our nation or upon that nation or that city, when Katrina hit New Orleans, people were saying, the wrath of God hit New Orleans. No, a hurricane did. Yeah, but God could have stopped nature. No. It would have contradicted who he was by giving this world free will. That's why he doesn't stop certain people. That's why he doesn't stop certain situations. That's, so, so God protected us. Yes, he protected us. But if that hurricane would have hit Pittsburgh, he would have protected us even then. If we would have been all wiped out, he would have protected us. But God doesn't operate in time. He operates in the here and now. And those that were hurt by it, he operates in his love. His holiness not only means that God is moral and God is good, holiness means that God is love. I, I quoted this question, this answer because uh, whoever does not know God does not know love because God is love. Whoever does not know love does not know God because God is love. God is not out to get us this big God who knows everything, who is everywhere, who is capable of doing everything, his all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere, holy God is here to do one thing and one thing 
only to express his love upon the world. Not to wipe us out. And we have to know that God is, everything that God is doing, since we are time people, everything that God did, everything that God is doing, and everything that God will do, because we're in time, is out of love for his creation. To express his love. So when bad things happen, God is already at work knowing what's about to happen. And see, here's the thing. God knew I was going to have a heart attack because he brought people in my way. Yes, because he knows all things. He knows that your artery is clogged. So he is sending people to you knowing that you have a clogged artery and you're not doing anything about it. So he's saying, hey, you need to go to this person because they're not healthy. You need to take care. Hey, you need to always be around this person in case something happens. And you have a heart attack and people are around you. God knew this was going to happen. Yes. He laid it on the hearts of people. And when we listen to God and we are in places and what we're supposed to be doing, then we are living out the will of God. Now, could we make the decision suddenly and go to the doctor and get open heart surgery and come out and be healed? Yes. <laughs> God knew I was going to do that? Yes, because when you decided that you were going to do it, he said, great, I told you. You see, it's your ultimate decision. God does not work in time and space. He works in love. And he works for the good of us. And he knows that bad things are going to happen because he can see it. And he sends people into our lives at the right time because he knows what's happening. Because he wants us to experience his love. And in all situations in our life, they all occur because God wants us to love him and experience his love. Guys, got it? <laughs> the present. Past and the future is encompassed in the present. This concept that I have about God being in the present and out of time does come from a guy named John Wesley. And um, it really focused things out and pulling God out of time and putting him in to a God situation, to supernatural God understand that God's working in this life is not him plotting my path of destruction but wanting to show his love to me all the time in all situations no matter whether I walk away from him or if I follow his will George before we go you had a question Okay, go ahead. Correct. God is always. <laughs> yes. God is always. And we are the ones who place them in time. And then once we place them in time, we say he has predestined, predetermined who we are. Some of these concepts we want to get out of our mind because we want to focus in on God's love, not on this big, omnipresent, omniscient, all-powerful, holy God who's trying to wipe us out,
but that we have this powerful love in our lives. This love that comes from a God who knows all things, who is everywhere, all powerful and holy because he is love. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have been here with you. We 
We ask you, Lord, that you will help us to understand your love, your gracious, beautiful love in our lives, a powerful, holy love. We ask you, Lord, that you will work, help us to pull you out of time and allow you to be God. set you in a in a box set parameters around you but to allow you to express this powerful holy love we ask you Lord that you'll be with J.R. and Michelle and Sarah that in the loss of their mother, that you will touch their lives, be with Curtis this morning, grandparents are very meaningful to us, and we have so much hurt in these families' lives, continue to watch over our congregation, help us to be safe over the next couple of days. Allow the love of God to be seen in us. And let us experience that love. We thank you, God. In your name, amen. God, that the highest of kings would welcome. But he brought me in on oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. The sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me. Thank you. Uh, wow, this came across clearer than my mic. Um, I want to thank the ladies for singing. We're going to take up a special offering for Emma. She has ripped jeans, and she needs... 
I'm glad you have a mask on because I can't see your face. <laughs> and, and since her parents cannot afford to get her new jeans, they're, they're not <clears throat> anyways, uh, there's, a, there's an offering plate in the back, and uh, just uh, d there is a memorial service being planned for Corin Roberts um, in the future, in the next couple of weeks. We'll let you know all the details about that as uh, that is planned. And um, uh, there, there's an offering plate in the plant back. You can put your offering in there. Thank you for being here. And finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power.